Welcome to M&A Science Live, where leading M&A practitioners share lessons learned from their experience. When you see, when you use proven techniques in M&A, more value is created. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from M&A Science, visit mascience.com and subscribe to our newsletter. That's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of M&A Science and Deal Room. Today, I'm here with Martin Rischenhagen, former CEO of Echo Corporation. Martin has a vast amount of experience in M&A, and today we're going to talk about why international deals fail. Our learning objective is how to prevent international deals from failing. Freut mich Sie kennen zu lernen. Hi, Martin. Hi. How are you doing? Freut mich Sie kennen zu lernen. Yeah, perfect. So, hey, what, could we kick off with maybe telling us a little bit about your background? Well, I actually uh, started my life as a high school teacher for several years, and then I did get an offer uh, from a private owned uh, steel company. I worked in that steel company for 10 years, and I did do everything from sales to logistics to MA already at that time. I didn't know that this was a science, so we just did it. And so then from there, I moved to Schindler Elevators and then uh, to a family-owned manufacturer of uh, agricultural equipment and uh, finally uh, was hired by Echo Corporation in 2004 and retired from Echo uh, this January. Wow. Wow. That's a great career path. I'm surprised that you started for, as a high school teacher and then launched into a track of M&A. Yeah. So that was actually uh, because I studied Roman matters, which is French and Italian languages, uh, theology and philosophy. And so that's how I became a teacher first. Well, let's talk about M&A transactions. As a CEO, how important is it to be involved with M&A deals? Well, first of all, I think uh, it, by coincidence, it was very important for my company because the company um, started as a management buyout of a completely failed uh, acquisition in the United States. So a German company, we can talk about that later, wanted to make a deal here in the United States and completely missed it. And from there on, uh, the company made about almost 30 acquisition, acquisitions and was very active in the consolidation of the industry, which happened uh, basically in the 80s and 90s. And so um, I was involved in acquisitions uh, right from the beginning because um, that steel company wanted to become a global, more global player. And so you always have the option between doing it in-house green field or maybe doing it through an acquisition. And we bought a business in the United States called uh, States called uh, Thomas Steel Strip. We bought it from U.S. Steel. And so that basically helped us to become a more global player at that time. Well, I want to understand how you get involved with these deals. Can you walk me through that in terms of what your approach looks like and just to get an understanding of what your role is? Well, I think the role of the CEO can uh, vary. Uh, I personally uh, knew the industry very, very well. And a lot of the targets were private-owned companies. So uh, it was always helpful to talk to the owner, to talk to the families, uh, in order to find out whether anything could uh, could be done. And so uh, some deals happened quickly uh, after w- only a few meetings, but some deals only happened after years. So uh, one of the last deals which uh, I closed at my company at Echo basically in uh in maybe 2018, I talked to the to the owners, Dutch com- Dutch family, first time, 20, year be- 20 years before. Wow. And so they, they didn't want to sell and they were not interested in talking. And so 
over time, basically, they came to the conclusion that uh, they might uh, consider a, a, a merger. So first lesson is to know your space. Does it sound like you really- yeah, One is you, you want to know your space. And then when you want to do attractive deals, which in the eyes of the buyer is, of course, um, don't overpay. Uh, and then pay a, a recent or decent multiple, then, of course, it helps if you, uh, first of all, it's better to do it with private owned than with, with public owned because public owned normally uh, have to do auctions. And in private owned, you can do some deals just for your uh, personal relationship uh, with, with the families or with the owners. Okay, so we want to, have a good idea of what the strategy looks like, understand where we're at with pricing uh, and at least get a sense of how we're looking at these deals and the value of them. Um, I'm, I'm curious about your approach to the whole relationship and courting. Like, what do those conversations look like? Well, uh, that, that depends, of course, of the, of the culture of the country uh, where, you, where you want to do a deal. So in some countries, you can be a little bit more straightforward. And in other countries, you need to first build a relationship before you even can think about uh, talking about something like that, because uh, people might find it very, very sensitive and might find it not very polite if you basically uh, meet them and say, hey, by the way, I want to buy you. So that's important to know. Also, management is important. So sometimes um, management is important in the decision-making process. And when you talk to management, you need to have a relationship first. You need to think about um, their perspective and you might want to talk about your, their career. Uh, you might offer them a job and things like that. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, can you give me examples? Because I think the culture part is fascinating where I feel like the America is a good example of where you're pretty forward. You can almost put in the email, hey, we're interested in talking to you about m and I have received one the other day, in fact. Uh, yeah, so, and I, I can I give you the... uh, several examples. So I can give you the example of a uh, leading company in Europe in the in the uh, in the paint business, and and uh, so this was a deal which was mainly public. And uh, the CEO of the American public owned company went there uh, and uh, talked to the media while just before before going to the meeting and then uh, wanted to to make a deal and of course the the target company saw this as an unfriendly act and an unfriendly approach the american ceo said oh i was very friendly so but in the field of acquisitions it's not friendly or unfriendly it's not a question of your style it's a question of does the other company want to talk or not. So, and if you, if you hear they don't want to talk, you have to be very careful uh, in how you, how you do it. And you have to be also very, very confidential and not try and trying to limit the amount of communication to third parties. So say you are going in a culture that is sensitive around the M&A conversation. You're not going to be so direct. How would you bring it up? Is it, I'm going to have a conversation just as a general get to know you. And then later on, maybe after one meeting or is it several meetings, then we start hinting at ideas around the strategic uh, view of doing an acquisition. What, what does that look like? How does that unfold? Yeah, but at Echo, we talked to a company, Japanese company, Kubota. And so the Japanese are an example of a culture which is difficult to understand for non-Japanese people. And so I think what you need to do is you need to first uh, create a relationship, uh, try to find a reason why you want to meet them, talk to the right people, which is the chairman and CEO most probably. If you have somebody who can introduce you, uh, it can be better sometimes. And then uh, basically the first meeting, you maybe don't talk about it at all. And then after maybe two, three meetings, you, you, you start to, uh, to raise this idea and it has to be somewhat generated in the common, common discussion together. And you might also look into the verbiage and to the words you're using. You might maybe not want to call it 
an acquisition, you might want to call it a merger. And so I'm on the board of a uh, American, uh, a German American company merger, which was actually a takeover. So a Praxair of America took over Lindy, a, a um, global player or important player in the area of industrial gas. And so the Sherman and CEO, the American Sherman and CEO, did it in a very, very careful way. And uh, they always called it a merger. And then they also uh, came in with the idea to call the new company Lindy. So that means to do, to do everything to make sure that the others uh, don't feel to be taken over. That's that's interesting. Isn't that a lot of traveling back and forth just to have? It is, mm-hmm. yes. If you want to do, uh, you maybe you don't want to do that for a 50 million company, but when you talk about a 10 billion business or a major business, I think uh, it needs traveling and it needs to meet people more than one time. Sometimes, of course, uh, this is the business of uh, private equity and banks uh, to 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 do things like that. But if you buy a company, and it's very easy and simple to buy a, a company from private equity because you already know they want to sell it. You know that the price will be high. <laughs> so, uh, but those are the easy the easy deals. So, if you want to do the more attractive deals, and if you want to do the more uh, um, kind of financially interesting deals, you want to you you you. It needs a little bit more work. Yes, you get that. You got to spend the time to court the relationship and be patient. Yes. And that is why also uh, during my active time. I always wanted to create a relationship with all competitors anyhow. So that means uh, 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 where, where can you meet them? You can meet them at trade shows. You can meet them uh, at associations. And so I basically started already in my previous uh, German private-owned company. This is why I why Echo hired me, because I knew the my predecessor, I knew already. And so um, we talked uh, before. And so when you have this kind of a relationship, uh, you already have basically laid uh, the base work for uh, further discussions in the future. And sometimes uh, it, it won't work. Sometimes people would say, well, actually, I don't want to sell. Uh, that doesn't mean that they, that they, will never sell. I can give you an example of a private-owned company in France. Uh, they are in the uh, soil preparation business and a major player in, in Europe. And so I met uh, the owner many, many years ago, so like something like maybe 25 years ago. I developed a very good relationship. I invited him to visit. Uh, I showed him the factories. Uh, I was re-invited, so which is already the, the beginning of a, of a light due diligence, if you like so. And then we ended up with a discussion where I offered him to buy his company. It was a smaller company, so the, the, the price I had in mind was somewhere between 200 and 250 million euros. And uh, so... He didn't want to sell, but the conclusion was what he what he told me is Martin if because we were already having enjoying a friendship is he said if I ever sell, uh, I will sell it to you wherever you are. So this guy came back to me in 2020, my last year in the job, and said now I'm prepared to sell. And we looked into the numbers and we looked into the factories and into the company and into their market position. And while we were interested in buying them maybe years before for 200, 250 million, we did not buy the company for 30 million. So that means sometimes it can be too late. And that can happen to uh that happens typically to uh, private-owned companies. So I have friends who owned a very important business in uh, in uh, switches, electric switches and things like that. 
uh, circuit breakers and so on. So they were the market leader in Europe, family owned. And so uh, the, the father, basically the, the daughter knew my wife. We had dinner, the father was talking about uh, uh, the question whether they should keep the business or not. I knew the daughter and I knew the son-in-law and I said, well, actually, if I would be you, I would strongly recommend to consider selling the company. And he did not. So he gave it, uh, basically, he handed it over to his son-in-law and the son-in-law, how I expected it to be, was really not capable to run it. So the company had a value of maybe $2 billion when we talked. And they ended up having to sell it because of liquidity issues for $350 million, maybe wow. five, six years later. Now comes the funny thing. We met the family again, and I was... I thought they would be depressed or disappointed. And so what the same guy said to us was, well, Martin, you know, we are only two of us. In the meantime, the daughter divorced from, from the guy. We are only two of us and my, my daughter. We are 85 years of age. We, we don't need the money anyhow. We are fine. So that means instead of thinking about what they missed, they were thinking about what do they really need. And they said, well, actually, our daughter uh, will be fine as well forever. So and there's plenty of money available for all of us. No problem. So but uh, this is the problem if, if, uh, if people don't really um, don't see the window of opportunities. I talked to many uh private owned or not many but few private owned survivors so to say our uh, the industry of agricultural equipment is pretty much consolidated so and i talked to some of the family owners uh, uh, who basically were german and italian and so and we we were talking about merging the company so we said well actually if we merge the company you would become a shareholder of eco corporation uh, of between 10, depending on the deal, 10 to 20%, something like that. And then uh, you could you could stay in if you like, or you could also start to sell whenever you want, because uh, you, you it would be a a good investment, but it, uh, it it would not be have to be an investment forever. So when we talked to these guys, uh, the stock, the share price of Echo was maybe around 50. Now it's around. Uh, while it was around 150, I didn't check today, so but let's say 120 to 140. So for them, that would have been a super deal. Yeah. And I still know those people. And uh, I, I, of course, talk still about it. And I said, well, actually, maybe you made a mistake here. And they said, no, 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 no. We didn't want to be part of a big public owned company. We want to be independent. So that's what uh, uh, happens very often with family-owned companies, more in Europe than in the U.S. Here in the U.S., uh, you have people who are more financially driven. And so the family ownership and then the, the, the name of the company and things like that don't matter so much to them. So when they see a, a great opportunity for a good deal, they might do it. These relationships are such an important part of the deal-making process. And I like your approach where you're very open-minded, where you don't shy away from having conversations and getting to know the, all the competitors in the space, where I feel like a lot of industry, that doesn't naturally happen. The competitors may, you know, talk negative about each other or something like that, uh, or maybe that's the cliche stereotype. How, how do you get past any concerns maybe somebody would otherwise have where, I'm going to meet with a competitor. Uh, I, I got to be careful of not divulging sensitive information, things like that. Is there any concerns when you're having those conversations as you're networking? With yeah, you you have those concerns mainly with very big U.S. companies, because for them legal is very very important, and so I and it depends. So I never had a problem, for example, to have open conversations with Caterpillar because they knew us, we had basically acquired 
their agricultural equipment division. So we had already maybe a more constructive relationship. Uh, we we the, we they Echo is still buying components from them. Uh, they basically are one of the exceptions to do business through their very strong and excellent dealer network in the United States. And so talking to them was not that difficult. Of course, everybody knows what you're allowed to talk about and what not. And uh, another example is uh, uh, with John Deere, it was always more sensitive. So uh, John Deere was always concerned that we would do something illegal or something borderline. And when you know that, you have to be, of course, much more careful. And you don't talk about uh, the business so much, but about the weather or golf or whatever. Uh, in America, it's most probably golf. So, but you 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 can uh, legally in the the legal framework you do business in, you still can manage to have a good relationship uh, without uh, breaking any any law. It, it goes back to that open mindedness because then you're having those conversations and like the example you provided, you ended up acquiring a business line. Maybe it wasn't for a whole and company, but what you said is true that in many industries. Uh, competitors see each other as enemies, uh, but you can change that. So I always changed it by going directly uh, to the people, introducing myself, uh, and just starting to talk. Uh, and of course, uh, what you want to do is you want to be interested uh, or interesting for them. So you talk about things they might want to know. They are very often, they of course want to know everything about you, but don't want to tell you nothing about them. So uh, my approach was always uh, to be a little open up front. I never really uh, disclosed important uh, secrets, but I always created the impression that I would willing to share certain information which they were interested in. Right. And there's always like common industry stuff you can gossip about. As yes. As and into. you can, let's say you, it's your choice when you have some, some tough CEO, old style, who thinks you are his biggest enemy. Um, just go there, just talk to them. John Deere saw me as their biggest uh, and most important competitor. And I can understand that because uh, the, the biggest John Deere dealer in the United States had a John Deere dealer meeting, said, what if Martin would run John Deere? Wouldn't that be beautiful? Of course, <laughs> the CEO at that time did, did not like that, uh, that statement. And so I heard about it and I called him and I said, well, actually, you have a great dealer here and don't worry about him. Uh, he's a little concerned because you're sometimes a little bureaucratic, you're a little slow, and that's something you should listen to your dealers or maybe a little better. And so this helps to basically ease up the situation. As a CEO of a Fortune 500 company working on this number of deals, what percentage of your time are you spending in developing and curating these relationships? Maybe... 30% of my time, something like that. So you basically need to keep your network alive. When you only talk to people, to let's call them targets. So when you only talk to targets in case you want something or you want to do something, they smell that and know that immediately. It's not bad after we had made so many acquisitions, we were known as a buyer, so to say. And that image is not completely bad because you know when people are interested in talking to you that there's some already some maybe base idea heading into the right direction. But um, uh, it can also uh, be in, in, uh, in your way. It can also be that uh, somebody doesn't want to talk to you because he knows already or he fears that you might bring something like that up. And then it depends on your reaction. If you if you keep it easy and say, well, actually, yeah, I understood. I'm fine. Uh, let's let's stay in, in in a good relationship. I have done deals where we basically met, and after two or three meetings, uh, we came to the conclusion: no, they don't want to sell. 
And then I, um, what I always told them is um, it might be that we don't that we are not interested anymore in the future because why do you buy uh, why, why do you make an acquisition? So you either want to increase your market share, you want to enter into a market you are not in, or you have a product gap which you want to close. And the, the, the last one, of course, if you can't close it by an acquisition, you do it by research and development. And so uh, that means people you talk to, when I joined the company, we were, we were very weak in combine harvesters. And so uh, I talked to people in order to find out whether we could do something together when the conclusion was no. We started our development program, which we, which we finished uh, in the meantime. And of course, now Echo is not so interested anymore in making uh, an acquisition in that area. So, and that is something you can explain to people you talk to. And then they're, of course, also not mad at you when they later come and say, well, actually, now I'm ready. And then you say, well, actually, but we are done. We are not interested anymore. Right. That's a lot. What do you do with other 30%? I'll tell you, 30% focused on developing these relationships. What are you using the other time for? Well, very important, depending on the company, but very important is investor relation and public relations. So you talk to your uh, shareholders, to the street, you talk to the media. And then, of course, it's important that you also have enough time to talk to your people. And I always had time also to just sit down and think and then come up with new strategic ideas to develop strategies. That's also, I think, strategies owned by the CEO and he should be really, really, be, really do it instead of outsourcing it from consultant firms. That's a lot to manage between the public facing so, sort of interest on the investment side, your internal people, courting some of the relationships to grow through the acquisitions and keeping your heads focused in strategy or having some uh, airtime for it. I loved it. And that was, let's say, I, I did that for almost 17 years, which is much more than the average in the Fortune 300s. And uh, I, I have to say, I really loved my job. Uh, I uh, was never running out of ideas. And uh, it was never boring. So it was always exciting. So there was not one day where I, where I went to the office and said, oh my gosh, how boring is this year? So I really had a great job. And that was because of mergers and acquisitions as well. So the, the first uh, Echo was basically founded in 1989 by a management buyout. And we started to talk about it at the beginning. There was a huge German conglomerate in Cologne called Klöckner Humboldt Deutz. And they were almost in everything. They had uh, a, they were the market leader in trucks. They had construction equipment. They had engines. They had heavy equipment. They had agricultural equipment. And so they were not very present here in the United States. And they came to the U.S. and bought a very solid, well-known company with a strong brand called Alice Chalmers. And now it's interesting to learn from that. It's almost like a case study. What did they do? The first thing is they basically fired all the executives. The second they changed the brand from Alice Chalmers into Deutz, which in America they used to call it Dutz or something like that, because it's a it's a it's a difficult word to pronu pronounce in in, in 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 English. Then, and that is typical for our industry, product seem has colors, paint colors by brand. John Deere is green. Massey Ferguson is red, and so on. So the uh, the uh, Alice Chalmers color, uh, color was uh, orange, and they changed the orange into green. So new color, new brand. So they lost a lot of identity, and they lost a lot of 
a, a brand image also in the marketplace. And then came a very severe technical mistake they made. Uh, the Deutsch tractor who was mainly made and developed for Western Europe and uh, Eastern Europe had a air-cooled diesel engine. So Deutsch was the inventor of the diesel engine, so they know about engines. And uh, so they decided to put that air-cooled engine into the American tractor, so they discontinued basically the American platform and only had the Deutsch platform for all countries without a lot of testing, and they had to find out that this air-cooled technology doesn't work so much in Texas and Arizona and in the hot climates of North America. So they ended up with revenues of about 250 million only from almost 2 billion at the beginning in the United States. And uh, the revenues were pretty much the same as the losses. So then they hired my predecessor, who had no idea about, uh, about that business. He was a guy who worked for international trucks and then for in the tire industry. And he came in with some colleagues, and they basically tried to fix it but couldn't. And so they were very American style, very honest, told uh, the Germans, well, that won't work. And so then the next job was try to sell it. And of course, who buys a company like that? Nobody did. And so the company ended up in a management buyout. And they bought it for a very low price. And uh, what they basically bought was the parts business. And this is basically how the founders of Echo started very interesting was their financial model. They basically sold all the uh, receivables and uh, were, were debt-free from the beginning, but they also were very lean on almost zero cash flow for two years. So that made them to be focused very much on cost. And from there... And I was watching that from the outside, but still already in the industry. From there, they did about uh, exactly 26 acquisitions. And that basically did grow the company to about 3 billion in revenues within 20 years. This was the number when I joined the company. So, um, and uh, what they were not so much into or what they didn't do well was the post-merger integration. They didn't care so much about it. So when I came, the company had 26 brands, uh, 60 different IT systems. They didn't have investor relation. They didn't have PR. Uh, human resource was really not important to them. They did not invest in research and development The in, in 2003 the spending in research and in, in, in development was 50 million, but they had a huge backlog on things which had to be done. And so when I joined, um, and that's a question of whether you like it or not, I took over a kind of interesting, but very, very chaotic company. There's a turnaround I, situation. Yes, it was a kind of a, uh, well, yes. And so um, stock price was about $8, earnings $1 per share, things like that. So when I left, stock price was $120, uh, revenues were close to $10 billion. Uh, we, we, were, we did have credit rating, which they didn't have at that time. We started to pay a dividend. And the spending for R&D were close to $500 billion every year. So this was a very entrepreneurial job. And uh, I compared to, let's say, when I still remember very well, when I was sitting in my office uh, in, in 2004, January 2004 in Atlanta, uh, I had the feeling to have a huge pile of puzzle parts on my desk without knowing the picture which it had to become. So, and uh, 
what I then did is I basically developed a strategy with a very small cross-functional, cross-hierarchical and international team with only a few weeks, which was then the picture we used. And then we started to build this picture from the, uh, from the components, from the stones we had. And typical for a puzzle is at the end, things accelerate. And so that means when I left uh, or before I left, the picture was perfect. And so my successor is a, is a much younger, but a great guy also from inside the industry. And he is basically uh, going and heading into the same direction. He's changing things as he should, but he's also, there's enough continuity uh, that I make sure that I'm very confident that this will be uh, also in the future will be a very good pl player in, in the industry. The market is down to three players only, so uh, that's all about mergers and acquisitions, consolidation. So there's uh, uh, Case New Holland, John Deere, and Echo. This is really fascinating. I want to walk through this deal and touch on some of the highlights you mentioned because our theme is around wider national deals fail. And you got a great example of a German company acquiring an American company. And you mentioned some interesting factors around it where one, they fired executives, they changed the brand, even changing the color of the, the products, the tractors made an impact. Uh, you mentioned a technological change from going from diesel engines to air cooled, which in certain hot weather climates didn't perform well. And now they had all these big technical issues to overcome. Um, it sounds like those were some of the key things that I heard uh, in terms of just this particular example of a deal as an international deal. Um, but can we talk a little bit about like, what are some of those factors that get overlooked that cause these de deals, particularly the international deals, which are obviously have its own unique challenges culture wise and, and a bunch of uh, things within that, that really make them hard and have a higher rate to fail. Well, we, we, we are just all watching the deal between Monsanto and Bayer. And I'm very close to Hugh Grant, who was running Monsanto, and Bauman, who is running Bayer now. Uh, so I think one very important thing is language. So you need to master the language in order to uh, be in a position to really understand the details. You need to be in a position, you need to be a very good listener, which very often is not the case. So when you buy a company, your people, your team might be looked at being slightly arrogant. And so that is something you want to avoid. So you want to listen to the, to the new team, to the people. You need to really very objectively assess the, the processes because you will find out that both sides might have excellent processes or not. So you need to understand what is, what is doing very, what is going very well and what is not going well, but not only in the target company, but also in your own company. What I always recommend is to keep the, uh, the management team in place for a certain period of time to uh, have enough time to understand how good they are, how strong they are. And then uh, you might uh, develop them into other positions in the company. But what I would never recommend, unless you have a real big problem, is to just come in and fire everybody. Because what you see then and what you will see is that know-how is basically, it's not only people leaving, it's know-how, it's experience, which is leaving with the people. So that is certainly something you, do, you, you want to avoid. And then you need to clearly understand when it comes uh, to, I think brands are important in depending on what business you are in, but uh, you need to understand the, the, you, the, the strengths of the brand you buy. And uh, uh, if, uh, if it's a, an important brand, which a legacy, which customer identification image, then of course you want to integrate the brand rather than destroy it. 
or sometimes as I was uh, uh, when I was talking about Lindy, sometimes the the brand of the company you buy might be stronger than the brand you have. And so uh, therefore you should not just because you are the new owner, change everything into your direction. So I got big cultural component where you need to be able to essentially speak their language and have an understanding of the culture. Uh, another factor that leads to failure is not listening and really paying attention to these details. And then the transition period in terms of having a good approach to working with the existing management team to ensure that transition and potentially even finding other opportunities um, that you can work with them on. And then the brand component where you may have a brand strategy, but it needs to be adaptive for this company and the way they may be positioned in that market it could potentially be stronger than your brand. What helps, is, uh, what helps, of course, is if you have a very strong corporate culture in your company. And that is something I focused on as well. So when I joined, actually not everybody or almost nobody wanted to work for us. It was a problem to hire good people. Uh, so uh, after only a few years, everybody wanted to work to, with us. And everybody knew that we also would be great people to, to own their businesses. Of course, uh, we also made mistakes. So that means... Uh, when when we want, we decided to go to China, where we did we were not present so much. So we only had a few small uh, uh, factories there, and we wanted to be there uh, much more than we had. And so um, we. And then the question is, do, can you buy something, or then what do we have to do? So we made a big investment in a state of the art tractor factory, including a world-leading new design, all green field, which was about $500 million. So we could control everything. And uh, so uh, we knew that this, uh, that this was, would work. So we also needed then in order, in our industry, you need to be a full liner. So that means you want to have Everything, your dealer should have everything the, you know, the farmer needs. So we then decided to buy a Chinese um, combine business, which was a former state-owned company, which then had been privatized and was owned now by the mayor of the city and some other guys. And so we decided to buy it. We uh, came to a deal and we bought uh, 70%. And uh, when we then owned it and looked into the performance, we figured out that it was per by far not performing as it should. We had two first-class American um, audit firms doing due diligence, plus our own people who are very or were very in, experienced in deals after they had done so many acquisitions. And so what had happened was that the seller basically just cheated on the numbers sold and produced. So they only produced and sold about half of what they had sold us, a little bit more. Oh. And so that was, of course, fraud. Now the question is, what do you do? I went to meet with the seller, with that mayor, and I said to him, well, a Chinese are very proud. They don't want to lose their face. They, want, they, they don't want to have an image problem at all, and specifically not politicians. And I was very straightforward to the guy, and I said, actually, you have two options here. Option one is um, you hand over this 30% ownership you still have to us for free. Option two is I make you the most famous person in China and you might end up in jail. <laughs> and he was scared. He was furious, everything. 
and left. So he was running out of the room from the dinner table. And so next day I went to his office. He was very polite, very kind, and everything was prepared. And we were the 100% owner the same day. So this was a bad deal with a mistake. I would have never believed that it could happen. Maybe it also can happen in country, only can happen in countries like that with a outcome, which was at the end still okay. That's a really interesting story. A great example of a culture clash, essentially. Yeah, it was a, who would believe that it's possible to basically, for instead of selling 8,000 combines, they only sold 4,000. So, and how is it possible that you can basically fake all your books? Uh, to, but they, they obviously were in a position to do that. Well, we do diligence. Um, and yeah, even with that, it's still hard to catch all that stuff. Due diligence is another very important subject. So it's very important. But when you want to do good deals, you sometimes compete with others. So to be fast on due diligence, fast and efficient and precise, is a comp competitive advantage. The second competitive advantage is when your financial model is simple. So when you need bank guarantees, state guarantees, uh, five banks to be involved or whatsoever, it's all, all, always much more difficult if you can do a simple deal. And in order to be in a position to do a simple deal for us, it was very important to, um, to have a super efficient bank relationship. And the bank we worked with was uh, Rabobank, a Dutch co-op bank owned by Dutch farmers. And they only invest in the food and agri sector. So that was a big advantage because they always knew what we were talking about. We didn't have to explain them from the creation of the world how our industry works. They knew that already. And they were very, very, very trustful. So we bought a business uh, uh, called GSI. They are in protein and grain storage. And so that was a deal of about, I think we ended up paying something between 800 to 900 million or something like that. So um, I talked to my board uh, and uh, we looked into it. And uh, it was, this was owned by private equity. There were competitors and so, um, the board was not really so convinced, but for us, it was a perfect fit and it still is a perfect fit for the company. So, um, but I didn't have any finance in place. So together with my CFO, I called the bank, the CEO of the bank, explained him what we wanted to do and was talking about the price, which would be somewhere around 800 million. And he said, well, actually, uh, you have my word for one billion. And uh, he explained why. He said, well, actually, maybe the 800 million won't work because you might be in a competitive uh, situation. So I cover you up to one billion. I had nothing in writing. But the relationship was so good that we could do that. And it worked out fine for all of us. Wow. And that, of course, is a big advantage when you basically say, well, actually, uh, we want to buy the company. This is the price. The money can be wired tomorrow. So that's a, that's, a, that's a completely different scenario than if you said, well, actually, I can imagine that we are interested. We need to do due diligence. We need to basically, I need, to, everything is subject to board approval and all that things. And, and then we have five banks. So um, I think uh, if you can, create a simple deal uh, that is always worth money because simple deals are always not as expensive as complicated deals. Right. Now that's a great example. Then you're more aggressive on terms and get the deal done. The culture clash examples are interesting. Do you have any more stories around culture clash? Well... <laughs> the company bought a, um, a company and a business in Finland. 
And uh, that was very interesting because uh, that Finnish company was uh, state owned wow. and just had been privatized. And so the privatization came with a certain request not to sell it to foreigners. And before joining Echo, I had a relationship with this company uh, and we formed a kind of what we called Star Alliance. We didn't have tractors, but they had, and we had all the other equipment. So we had a very, very close relationship. And uh, so then Echo was interested in buying the business and before even joining, uh, uh, the, my predecessor talked to me about it because he knew that it would happen or close when I was, was on board. And he said, but the problem is they don't want to sell it to Americans. And I said, well, actually, I will talk to them. And uh, I talked to the, to the CEO I talked of the tractor company who knew me very well. I talked to the CEO of the holding company I knew very well. He was a former secretary of uh, business, of economy of Finland. And then uh, he said, well, actually, we might want to talk to the uh, president together. So Finland is a small country. So that means immediately we had a meeting with the president and I was introduced as the best friend of the uh, secretary of uh, economy. And he said, yeah, well, actually, the buyer is an American public owned company, but this is the incoming CEO. He's not an American, he's a German. Uh, he's our friend, we know him for many years. And so without any legal work, uh, the government decided to support the deal or not go against it. And we were in a position to buy the company. So uh, that's a very interesting uh, cultural situation. And Finnish people are uh, very different. So they don't talk so much. And you have to be for Americans that very, that's very scary. So when I uh, uh, met with the management of the target first time, uh, we ended up after dinner, we ended up naked in sauna. So, and that is actually unusual. Americans tend to sit there then with, uh, with a bath rope or yeah. boxer shorts or something like that. So, um, the, uh, the good thing is, uh, the Finns are people you can trust. So a word is a word. And so another element of that deal was now, that my predecessor, because he wanted to be fast and because of a very light and quick due diligence, um, decided to sell about 100 million of synergies to the street. And when I then joined, he said, well, actually, now you know we own it. And thank you for your support. Now you need to find the 100 million. And I said, well, don't you have any idea? Well, no, no, we have no idea about it. And I said, who is in charge of it? Oh, the CEO is. <coughs> I called the CEO and he said, well, that's completely stupid. There are no 100 million in synergies. And by the way, I retire. <laughs> so the guy who I knew very well uh, decided to leave because he saw that challenge being so unrealistic that he couldn't, and he, was, he didn't think that he could do it. And so uh, this was actually also something where you have to be careful. I think you need to be conservative on the synergies. If you, if you don't do that, you end up in a, in a, in a very bad situation. Uh, another thing is also now in times where multiples get higher and higher, you might end up with, uh, with higher goodwill. And uh, that is something you have to be honestly, which has to be analyzed and you have to think about it. You have to also have a worst case or risk assessment where if the, the deal is still um, strategically very attractive and where you believe in growth, you still have to have a scenario where you basically know 
what happens if the ghost doesn't come in, which means you will have to hide off goodwill. Yeah, no, but, uh, and that you can only do uh, if, you, if your other business is uh, strong. Right. So that's the challenge. How do you keep from that happening, from being overzealous on this, catching the deal fever, uh, and avoiding that whole you know goodwill impairment situation? Well, I think uh, normally uh, you need to keep your cool when you do a deal. So I was never in a situation where I was personally so excited and, and enthused uh, that I desperately wanted to do it. There were deals I really wanted to do, uh, but uh, finally, if the numbers uh, don't work, you walk away. And the only exception is that you have a idea and that's basically typically in the, let's say, our industry is uh, digitalizing, uh, dig uh, it's going more and more digital. And so those uh, smaller digital startups, uh, they very often uh, come with very, very high multiples. And then you need to think about it and you can do a kind of opportunity cost check. What would it cost if I did it in-house? And then uh, that helps you. But uh, you still need to also plan for potential worst case uh, impairments. So sort of model things out best and worst case and yes. be pretty conscious. Yes. What's the best advice you'd give for people in the M&A space to increase their success on deals? I think the best advice is uh, what I said is uh, you need to be a good communicator, a good listener. And you need to understand your business very well. And you need to understand the target business even better. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I think some of the other things you mentioned too about uh, the culture is a big piece as well. And uh, I think at the end of this interview, Martin, I learned the relationships trump all. Yeah, this is why Trump was such a bad deal maker. <laughs> His personal... <laughs> He was never in a position to really have good relationship to, to uh, important people. <laughs> to keep it going. What, um, what was your favorite thing about being a, a Fortune 500 CEO? Well, um, I think what I liked was uh, the American um, culture in a way that uh, in, Amer in, in some other countries, um, your image is based on how much noise you make, how much PR you do, and they call it then charisma and things like that. In America, uh, we have a welcoming culture and you are basically just, just judged upon uh, the, the measurable results you generate. And I started at Wall Street, at Wall Street as a nobody, and uh, I ended as somebody everybody knows, everybody on the business council, business roundtable, in the administration knew, and the nickname was the German Tractor King. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I had a pretty good image because of the performance of the company, not because of the bullshit I was, uh, I was telling people. Hard work pays off in this culture. Yes. What was your least favorite thing about being a public company CEO? I think that is analysts at the beginning. Uh, you, uh, I wasn't used to that style. They are young. They're extremely aggressive. They're extremely impolite. Uh, they don't know a lot about your business and they still attack you all the time. And that's something you need to understand and you need to cope with. I can imagine that being a challenge from the number of earning calls I've listened in on. Have you, I was curious on, on those earnings calls, do these analysts even correlate the M&A activity with the actual growth of the organization? Or do you see that as a gap oftentimes? Because you've been on a lot more earning calls than I have. No, no, M&A was always important for them. So it's very important that they understand the logic, that they believe that you can handle it that they believe that it fits into your business, that you understand what the other company is doing and things like that. 
So that means they are not very creative. So when you produce tractors and buy another tractor business, that's fine for them. When you're in tractors and buy a grain storage business, they might already say, oh, no, how can that work? And so that needs then a little bit more uh, uh, explanation and, and a little bit more uh, uh, background information for them. Yeah, right, to paint the picture. Martin, what's the craziest thing you've seen in m and I think the craziest thing I saw uh, uh, is the deal between uh, Bayer and Monsanto. Just two huge conglomerates of equals merging together? Yes, yes. And two cultures, two different cultures. And then what uh, happened, and this I, I think is something one could have seen coming, is Americans, between Americans, handle everything, inclu including legal issues. As soon as a company is not owned by Americans anymore, out of a sudden, the legal environment gets by far more, more tense and more aggressive. And I think that happened to Bayer. So now they have to pay for maybe mistakes Monsanto has made. Monsanto, Monsanto was somewhat allowed to do that, and then now Bayer, not anymore. Wow. I'm talking about Roundup and things like that. So these large, yeah, that was a big element of it. So really yeah. interesting with uh, a lot of challenges in that deal with the whole nature of the different cultures, the international aspects, and just being large entities of each of their own. And another deal I, I found very interesting was the, the merger between Mercedes and Chrysler, uh, where I know Dita Setcher very well, the guy who basically was first Arning Chrysler, and then uh, he was became the CEO of Mercedes or Daimler, uh, the holding. And so that was very interesting to see because this the idea behind was Mercedes wanted to basically gain market share in in the United States, and that completely failed. And uh, uh, so. I think it failed also because of a mismatch of cultures. Uh, I agree. That's the classic example I actually referenced in the book I published about that transaction and a lot of the cultural challenges that happened that uh, eventually unwound the deal. Yeah. And it's very funny in this industry, uh, interesting things happen. So I don't know, nobody remembers, but Mercedes at the beginning or the shareholder in Tesla. And uh, they sold their shares to get out of it with a loss. Wow. I think they, they wouldn't do that again. <laughs> I didn't hear that story. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Martin, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed hearing your stories and insights on M&A. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank and you. we hope that your audience likes uh, what we were talking about. I'm, I'm pretty sure they will. And here's to the deal. Yes.